I mean, the whole idea of, of, you know, where the digital avatar is going and whether we're going to realistically see some kind of immersive augmented reality space that's going to be the dominant uh, economic uh, world. It's, it's, it's hard to envision and I'm, and I'm just curious to know. I mean, I've been waiting for it and sort of seeing it, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I'm curious to just, just to see where it's all going for sure. I mean, my prime examples of the most inter- interesting kinds of bodies that you can uh, inhabit are things that are not even, not even close to being humanoid or, or biological, something like being a room or like a, an object or something that can, you know, or a gaseous state or something. I mean, it's all, it's all forms that, especially in, in VR, for example, when you're wearing a headset, you don't even need a mo, a mocap suit. You can kind of get some pretty preliminary data on how the head moves, how your hands move, and you can kind of like fake the rest and you'd be surprised at the amount of immersion you can get just from, from those few points of data. Uh, and one of the cool things that you do in VR chat is you put on, uh, some kind of avatar, they're all free. They're just like all sitting all over the place, or you can kind of create your own and you look in a mirror. That's like kind of the dominant behavior. You put something on and there's all these mirrors in like the, in the world. And you can kind of like, you know, you make a motion and then you watch yourself make that motion. You get some kind of, uh, one-to-one relationship between you and this new form of, uh, these, this new appendage or something, this new arm, or in the case where you're like a space, a room or an object. I don't know. It makes you, it really forces this idea of re, uh, re-examining your representation as a, as a consciousness or something. If you wanted to publish something online, let's say in 2005, six, seven, you would have to know how to manipulate 5D camera, the SD cards, Photoshop to like resize the pictures by yourself, compress the files, upload them to a uh, WordPress or uh, all those like blogging platforms. And then people would have to use RSS feeds to follow you. You couldn't just like follow someone. You had to like sign up for an RSS feed and then copy paste the RSS link. And it was super complex. So many manipulations, so many things had to be done to, to coordinate this content stream. And then for about five years, Blue Girls completely took over the space. They uh, made, and we, because we were running a platform for Blue Girls, we made fashion editors mad because we were basically taking things that they spent like 20 years to build and suddenly like catapulting kids who were like 15 years old in the front row of the the fashion shows and so on. And it was fascinating to me and uh, that's how I got into the anthropology of like what's behind fashion, not from like the experience itself, but from the analytics. In a post-truth environment, I think the fundamental condition of truth being always presented as being simultaneously like or facts or messages presented as it is both true and false at the same time is very much just kind of the nature of just how information is being communicated today. And so this sort of like quantum sort of nature of like truth being very destable um, lends itself well to memes being a very strong kind of like vehicle to transmit information because of the fact that memes allow you to use humor, especially like nihilistic, absurdist, existential humor in this very post-ironic way where you can both like laugh at the joke as an outsider, but be part of the joke as an insider, right? I mean, it's why like Balenciaga like is like what it is, right? Like you, when you like like Balenciaga, you are both laughing at the joke and you are the joke at the same time, right? And that's very much kind of like the whole, the whole vibe. So, you know, I think the like irony and, you know, for example, even that product campaign, like part of the reason why that campaign did so well is it became a whole meme. Like you were making fun of it, you know, the whole, the whole time as well. Like some of those questions I will admit are, are quite, you know, like kind of the prompts are a little bit ridiculous, like very like kind of like I'm 14 and deep kind of, you know, type of uh, prompts. But, you know, I-, I loved it. I know that Prada was a little worried. They actually were like, do we think this is a bad thing? I'm like, this is amazing. Like the fact that you are memeing your campaign is like a great success signal. I think ultimately when it comes to brands, I try not to, you know, steer too much into that territory. I mean, with like Sequoia, we, we did do that. You know, Web3 is a bit different. It's very anti-authoritarian and anti-establishment. So I think it lends itself better. But, you know, I think always when you try to make something more corporate, you try, I try not to like kind of exploit or extract from those kind of cultures and keep them more pure and authentic. You can be opportunistic when the opportunity arises versus trying to engineer it as a company, because I think that's just really disingenuous. And I think that applies to a lot of things. Yeah. 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 Yeah.